This week on the Sports Initiative podcast, I sit down with basketball coach Alex Sarama. He discusses his constraint-led approach, which is taking basketball coaching by storm, why he believes in this philosophy and how it benefits the players, as well as some of his observations when working for the NBA. As always, if you enjoy this podcast, please make sure you share with friends and family. I hope you enjoy. Perfect. So Alex, listen, really appreciate you jumping on. I know we caught up briefly then, but it sounds like uh, you're all good out in in Italy, all safe and well. Absolutely. Pleasure to connect, Michael. Thanks so much for having me on the podcast. Looking forward to this conversation and seeing where it takes us. Perfect. So um, I guess for people that don't know you, do you just want to give a bit of a background in terms of what your current role is and what that entails? Absolutely. So currently, um, I'm running an academy in the north of Italy, about an hour west of Milan. And it's for boys aged between 16 and 19 years old. And all the players come from different countries all over the world. So we don't actually have any Italian players here. Uh, We've got like 11 different countries represented. Um, And basically, the idea with with what I'm doing is I'm, I'm trying to show coaches and really show them how you can implement evidence-informed coaching into everything kind of we do. And hopefully this will act as a case study so that players all over the world can then receive a better experience. So, you know, I'd say I'm very focused on trying to learn as much as I can from the research and then immediately implement that into, you know, our player development, our team development, the strength and conditioning, so, so that we have a really kind of well-rounded approach to everything we do and ultimately the goal is to develop players for higher levels of basketball so for a lot of the guys that would be NCAA careers or professional leagues in Europe so basically they spend time with me it's year-round they do all their school remotely distance learning Um, we compete in tournaments all over Europe and then after once they once they hit 19 I prepare them for and send them off somewhere else. Perfect. So I guess it sounds like you're trying to take a holistic approach. So for your guys' uh, academy, if you will, what would you say is the the main strap line in terms of evidential uh, research that you go, right, this is what our our bread and butter is, if you like. What would you say the main thing an individual coming to your program can expect? Great. So I'd say um, ecological dynamics, constraint-led approach, um, that's really key. And I, I think it's um, it's interesting because I think, and I know there are a lot of programs all over the world, but I think kind of, I would say, I like to think that we're kind of the first program to consistently adopt it and do it in everything we do. So for instance, what I mean by that is, especially in basketball, a lot of coaches will dip in between traditional drills and a small sided game. And for me, that's not using the constraint led approach because you're suggesting that there's a very specific solution talking about techniques and parting a specific mental model. A lot of the times they create, coaches will create a small sided game and encourage them to use the technique that they just learned within that small sided game. But for me, that's not an ecological approach. So um, I'm really trying to be the first program where we really go full in, uh, two feet in, into ecological dynamics. And the results have been amazing. Um, And I'd say that is all combined with the idea of transformational coaching. So um, again, it's I like to think we're different, not just in terms of the actual work we're doing with the boys and how we play basketball, our style of play framework, player development. but I'm very, very big on the fact and their relationships with me and my staff are critical. And it's it's quite concerning, actually, Michael, to see the behaviors which exist in a lot of kind of performance youth environments. And I'd say it's very transactional. Like coaches are very, typically very, like very, very much an authority figure within their organization. They kind of motivate players through fear and punishments and for me it's no it's that's a big no-no and i actually would say that the transformational coaching is the most important thing and creating that environment where it's a safe environment and young men can come here and 
be really happy and really develop as people and, you know, look back on this in like five, 10 years, 15 years, and just have nothing but amazing memories because of how I and my staff treat them. So if we're talking about an ecological approach, kind of define that for us. And then what does that actually look like in practice? Yeah, absolutely. So I'd say ecological dynamics, it basically stems from the ideas of dynamic systems theory and, and ecological psychology. So let me put this in some specific sport and basketball examples so it, it makes sense to coaches. So dynamic systems theory, I'd say the key thing there is really looking at self-organization and how individuals, i.e. humans, can self-organize to move based on the information available to them within their environment. And again, part of dynamic system series that it, we're embracing the fact that humans, and especially team sports like basketball, soccer, uh, football, volleyball, are complex systems. So what that means is they're very unpredictable and very small changes could lead to large differences. So essentially, it, you know, dynamic system theory, we're looking at self-organization in the light of constraints. And then that pairs with the ideas of ecological psychology, which is basically the essence of affordances and perception and action coupling. So the idea is that players in our sport, taking basketball, they will self-organize to produce the movements that are visible within skills, whether that's dribbling the ball down the court, making a pass, shooting the ball. They will self-organize to do that based on the affordances and the information that they see within their environment. And obviously their, their ability to act on an affordance, for instance, seeing a space and seeing, a, you know, maybe a defender's position is uh, allowing them to dribble towards that space. That is obviously... Uh, the ability to do that is based on their action capabilities. And the only way they know if they can do that is playing small-sided games in practice, right? And the problem is a lot of players don't be, they're not put in these situations and they don't even know even what they're capable of. And they're not used to detecting and acting upon affordances in practice. And I think that's the idea of ecological dynamics of which the key part of that forming that is the constraint-led approach. So I'd be amiss not to mention Neural's constraints model. So essentially the idea that summing this all together, it sums everything together nicely that I've just spoken about. So we have task, individual, environmental constraints, um, which basically affect all those movement solutions. So those constraints interact to shape the self-organization and the, the skills that we see that are visible within the actual game. And I know that's it's quite complex, some of the things I just said, and the language is a barrier, but I do encourage any coaches kind of listening to this on my Twitter, that's where I share a lot of the, and my Instagram, I share a lot of the examples of what this looks like in my sport, in basketball. So for instance, today I shared an, uh, an example where I was showing coaches what affordances were and what perception action coupling is and what that looks like in, in the one basketball specific context. So I, I have a base level of basketball knowledge, so I'm going to try and give some accurate representation to what you're saying. I think that you can fill Love in it. the blanks. So if we're, we're talking about players in a pick and roll, for example, so a high pick and roll, you've got your point guard, centers come out to set the screen. Um, Obviously, there's a there's a multitude of factors that are going to go into how the defenders are defending them as to what action that might then be required. So, if the defender is going to go under the screen, the point guard defender is going to go under the screen. That might leave space to potentially um, shoot the three pointer. If, for example, he is going to follow you around the screen, it might be an opportunity to drive into the lane. How, on a base level, do you get the players to begin to identify? what action is required at that moment in time? Okay, this is amazing. You've got more than just a bit of basketball knowledge. That was great. So um, for, this is a really good example of how we can kind of look at the CLA in a basketball-specific context. So pick and roll, um, obviously there are a lot of different constraints to look at. First, we've got individual constraints, and this is key because – you know, different sizes and wingspans and different abilities there are going to shape different solutions. For instance, 
a really big and tall point guard, take someone like Luka Doncic, who's, you know, one of the best players in the world right now, he's going to be able to make part, he's going to have more affordances to make passes, direct pocket passes to the roller who's going towards the basket or to pass to other teammates if their def- defense are tagging, which is basically helping to go towards the roller and take that away because he's bigger and he's he's got a bigger wingspan and size than a lot of the defenders who will be guarding him. So he has more opportunities for action to do passes than maybe a five foot 10 point guard. But maybe a smaller point guard is really explosive, can accelerate really fast. So they look to reject more and not use the pick, go away from the defense and start driving towards the rim to draw other help defenders before they kick it out. So again, you know, maybe looking at the role of the picker, you know, the guy actually setting that pick, maybe they're, they're really fast and they can immediately accelerate fast out of that pick to get to the rim. They're going to have more affordances for lob passes, right? To, to catch those lobs and finish. Whereas maybe a heavier picker, like one of my players, here, he's an amazing, um, kind of big because he's so attuned to all these different scenarios in the pick and roll. He's not very fast accelerating. So for instance, he's not going to be able to slip quickly and get on the rim because he's just not that fast. So for him, maybe he's going to seal more and use his body to create that advantage and get the defense behind him before he starts rolling. So we've got a fact of these individual constraints in. And then obviously you said you alluded to it with the task constraints and you spoke about the high pick and roll. The location of the pick and roll is going to shape some of the solution because, you know, maybe it's on the wing, maybe it's in the middle, maybe it's on the 45. Um, so pair that with the individual constraints, different things will happen. And the main thing, of course, is the type of defense, right? So players, it's essential that players are attuned to actually looking, perceiving the information in the environment, seeing the defensive coverage, and then coming up with a solution. Now, this is answering your question. That that kind of lays the foundation. What determines what solution they use? So again, we... We talk about with my players, we talk about coverage solutions. So for every type of defensive coverage, we have many solutions available to them. And the key thing is I'm not being super restrictive here and narrowing them to specific things because um, that would be over constraining. And I we could be missing out on some coverage solutions which are really effective for the type of players we have. So rather what we talk about is how different coverage solutions a lot of things can be used against the same defense. For instance, take a reject, right? Where the ball handler doesn't use the pick, they dribble away from it. That would work against pretty much any type of defensive coverage. Even a, a slip where the picker doesn't make contact on the pick, but they escape quickly and start sprinting towards the rim. Same thing, pretty much any coverage that, that will work with. So w- we talk about, you know, we have a framework of different solutions and that, at the start of the season, we actually, I let the players self-discover it. So I would put them in small-sided games and we would play with different defensive coverages. So we'd have things like a switch, a drop coverage, a blitz where we trap and both defenders go to the handler. But then they would naturally try solutions. And then what we did, so we had a shared understanding and kind of terminology. We would then, once they self-discovered those, we would name them. So then we'll be like, all right, this is a reject. This was a slip. This was a short roll. So naturally, um, then we had a terminology and they, they kind of understood what some of the solutions are that are available to them, but I'm not restricting them to one specific one. I'm letting them choose based on the task constraints that are present for each situation. And I think a key thing here too, Michael, is like some of these solutions are very specific, right? And this is where I'm, you know, I'm, I'm working on this right now, trying to find the balance because, you know, a lot of the ecological kind of language talk talks about not showing the players one specific solution, right? And this is where I'm torn in two minds because certainly regarding like technical biomechanical things, we would never talk about doing things a certain way, i.e. shooting the ball the same way every time passing. But there are some some specific coverage solutions we have which are a little bit more complex, which I think are very difficult to be self-discovered. Take, for instance, for any basketball coaches listening, something like a ghost screen or a via pick and roll. 
So for me, it's like I do some of these less obvious coverage solutions. I will show them to the boys, but critically making it very clear that anything could happen as we do this. So take, for instance, a ghost screen. As we do the ghost screen, there could be loads of different new solutions that emerge. So we're not just looking for one particular thing. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And I guess my question off the, the back of that is how do individuals develop the self-awareness of what their game is to then the, how that would affect the solution? So if I look at um, the Aaron Fox, for example, who's very good yeah. at driving into lane, very quick, he would have to have a level of self-awareness that maybe he's not Damian Lillard and he's not going to be able to shoot from deeper and actually he's going to need to drive. But obviously you're working with individuals who are younger than that. So how do they yes. de develop the understanding of this is what my game is currently? And then also how do they then go, well, this is where I want it to get to. So this is what I need to work on because they might be very good at driving but have identified they want to be better at three-point shooting. So they need exposure to both yeah. rather than just searching for a success. Absolutely. So basically that's ex exactly what you just said is players knowing their action capabilities. Like what, essentially what coverage solutions are they capable of performing, right? And this is the essence of it. For me, the player development is where I develop a lot of it and I put them in situations where they can try different things. So within our player development settings, we do quite a few two-on-ones and two-on-twos out of the different coverage solutions where they can try different things and actually learn what is working for them, right? So I think the like the smaller, small-sided games are where I'm focused more on, especially because they're young players, on widening what they're capable of so that they can perform different coverage solutions. And I think... You know, it's a lot of the things we do. Um, it's constantly developing, developing them so that they're, they're understanding these things and actually getting enough chances to do it. So for instance, in our two on ones, two on twos, we do something called bursts a lot where it's rapid fire and where maybe the offense and defense stay for like, a minute no rotation and they're just getting repetition at repetition constantly for that whole minute so i expose them to it and then we become gradually through this you, you know they've used to these different solutions and then it's it's a case of increasing the level of game like task representative practice adding like transition trips in and then seeing if they can actually you know look for these coverage solutions within the chaos and and everything of the game I'd say then when it comes to our like five on five in practices when we're actually playing, which is a lot, that's when they mold kind of their strengths to um, their like what they can do best coverage solutions. And they look for those more in the five on five, right? So it's like experimenting, they experiment more in the player development. I create a safe environment where they can do that. And then when we're scrimmaging, that's when they're more thinking you know, what solutions work for the task constraints, the players I'm playing with, et cetera. Um, and the player development, Michael, is key. So we have player development plans each month, so supported by film. And for that, it's all, you know, self, a lot of it is self-identified with the players coming up with the three things that they want to focus on expanding with that month. But also they look at their anchors, which are basically the things they do well at. So it's, that's kind of how I naturally nudged them towards being more self-aware. And I will say too, um, we film every practice and I, I actually don't, I haven't done many film breakdowns recently, but most of my guys watch the video back. So they're watching every practice back every day. And it's great because then just seeing things and reaching their own conclusions. When you're looking at, uh those idps what form do they take are they written down agreed upon are they um, spoken what, what yeah so it's a written kind of template i have with blanks which the players fill in so they spend time filling it in and it will basically be three specific things that they want to work on that month and then together once they have it we sit down in a meeting and come up with the goals and 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 look at the actual things that they're going to do to work on that. 
So for instance, in that means in player development, it can't be a case of one size fits all, right? And this is the problem I see where everyone's doing the same thing. So for instance, maybe the first 20 minutes of a player dev session or team practice, it's 15 minutes. And I say, all right, guys, uh, you're going to work on your player development plans. So I put them in small groups where, you know, every five minutes, maybe the small side of the game changes, but we'll focus on what one player particularly needs within that right and obviously if players have the same thing they're working on i'll pair them so they're doing the same so we might have like three or four different small sided games going on at the same time in the practice um and then and then this is the hard thing which has been difficult michael is having ways we can actually evaluate it because obviously we got to appreciate the non-linearity of learning and the fact that was complex but I think it is nice to incentivize the players to actually have a way to measure the goal. Problem is, is um, I, I since December, I've been a one-man team. So it's just been me. I haven't had my assistants. So with a full staff and with access to more resources, I would definitely like to kind of integrate this more. But I still think for what we're doing right now and the level that we're at, I think it's it's really good. It's because, you know, it's... Even in the NBA, I see a lot of player development plans, which is just, it's a random list of techniques. It's like a checklist of techniques and it's all random. Players just do these things one on zero. That, that to me isn't player development. So what, how do you evaluate it then? So how do you go around creating either a framework or, you know, a quantifiable, um, yeah, okay. to do? Well, how do you do that? Absolutely. So let's say a player wants to um, work on their coverage solutions against the switching defense and they're the ball handler, okay? So we could say something like, if I had the staff, I would do this. We'd watch every pick and roll possession of their games that month and 70% of the time, they've got to come up with a solution which cr which creates an advantage um, after the next pass from whatever they do. So they're basically creating an advantage within three seconds of handing the ball against that switch, right? And if if they can't do that, then they're neutral. They're a prisoner of the coverage. They haven't applied any solution, right? So that is an example of something tangible where I'd have every possession clipped against the switching D and show all the like successful solutions, all the varied sort of coverage solutions and the ones which weren't successful. So it's... It's basically trying to think of tangible things which which are attainable for players and not too easy and not too hard. But again, it's like for me next year, I'll be able to do this and track it because I'll have hopefully four, including me, a professional staff of four coaches so we can really go into this detail. Okay, and so in terms of um, you've got your anchors and stuff, which obviously things that they're super strengths, if you like. When you're looking to develop a skill, obviously you're probably going to get a high level of failure before you get that success. So how do you go around supporting the players through that failure, particularly if it's a skill either they haven't been yeah. taught before or something that you're like, listen, for you to make that next step, this is a non-negotiable. You have to be able to do it. Totally. So within the PDP, I basically have three types of goal. So it's either a 100-meter sprint, which is something within the next month they can do immediately and start using and actually having that skill emerge in games, not just practices. Then we'd have a 400-meter race, which is something which takes a few months. You know, it could be two, three, or four months. And then a goal, which is a marathon, which takes the whole season. Or if it's a player I know I have for two or three seasons, even longer. So... It's like, so for, so for instance, something like for a non-shooter non to come in, it's not realistic for me to be like, all right, after a month, you're going to be shooting 38% from the three-point line, right? So to develop that shooting, it's going to be a marathon. It's going to take the whole season, but bit by bit, we have attainable realistic goals. So maybe, for instance, within within a two-on-one shooting small-sided game, um, you know, they can, even if they're not, they're not missing. I want to start with them making the right decisions when as to when to shoot. So are they open? Is it in range on balance? Like a rub shot, range open balance. So it's like, are they doing that? And then gradually, it's like through all the differential learning, CLA kind of activities we're doing, 
that stream is going to emerge. And I, I think a key part of it is um, when players feel the improvement, they're so motivated. And um, this is the thing, because like, cause I've got the guys for a good amount of time and the improvement is... Obviously, we have to appreciate that improvement is non-linear, but they see sudden jumps and things they're doing which they never thought they're capable of. And I think that's what really gets the buy-in from the PDP because they fully trust me as their coach and they see it working and then they want more, you know? Um, so if you're taking someone like, uh, I'm a San Antonio Spurs fan, so let's go someone like DeMar DeRozan. Obviously, it's widespread and well-known that he doesn't shoot three-pointers particularly well and has probably made a career kind of in the mid-game or driving into the, into the post which there's nothing wrong with, but I think in kind of today's NBA, if you like, that seems to be a um, a bit of an anomaly. How would you go around supporting him to get to a place where he's comfortable in taking yeah. those types of shots and making them more successfully? Okay, great question. So I think firstly, we've got to look at the type of practice which traditionally has been predominant in the NBA for bad shooters. And this would be more traditional practice, more constant blocked practice, where players do like form shooting to try and identify supposed poor habits, or they're just doing spot shooting, which are mindless, like reps on reps on reps. And the problem with this is it's, it's narrowing the player's solution space even more. So basically, to understand shooting, we have to understand some of Bernstein's work and the degrees of freedom. So the degrees of freedom or all the potential combinations a player can use to move and coordinate their body to shoot the ball. So I think in the essence of a jump shot, you know, the how to like the positioning and angles and coordination between like wrist, elbow, shoulders, lower body, all of this stuff, right? The problem is for, for my my approach from a non-linear perspective would be instead of confining a player like that to shooting one way and trying to use internal explicit feedback to correct his biomechanics, I would get him shooting as many different ways as possible to get him used to moving and shooting in different ways with the idea being that we can nudge him towards finding a more stable, more beneficial solution. And I don't know what that solution necessarily is, but what I can do is create an environment where he's figuring that out for himself based on some of his individual constraints. So what I would do is use a lot of CLA type activities such as one-on-ones and two-on-ones, right? And I'd pair that with differential learning. Now, I've spoken about this with one NBA coach who I respect a lot because he's, I think he's the first NBA coach really embracing and incorporating the evidence into the stuff he's doing. And um, we, you have to remember Maya for this most advanced yet acceptable. Some of my differential learning exercises I cannot do with an NBA player because it, they're not going to want to do it, especially at the start when we have no relationship. But maybe some, some of the ones such as passing the ball in different locations, so they're always shooting from a different place, a different movement every time. So sometimes they're going to do it like it will be a drive and kick. Sometimes they're going to go screens. Sometimes they're going to relocate second cut. Every rep is different. For sure we can do that. So basically just creating repetition at repetition in their shooting environment using differential learning and CLA. And the idea is gradually as my, as I develop that relationship with the player and maybe they really see improvement in some areas of their game, they're going to want to do more. And then gradually maybe I could then do some more advanced differential learning exercises, things which are a little bit more weird, like different stances, different arcs, different release speeds. The whole idea being here that they're really we're destabilizing their current solution and nudging them towards new ones. And for, and for me, if you look at all the non-shooters in the NBA, you typically see, again, look at Bernstein's work. Their degrees of freedom are frozen, and it look their shot looks very rigid and awkward because they don't know how to coordinate their body. So if you try and fix that with a shooting coach, as it's been done traditionally, they're all. The idea is, you know, the common idea is you have to shoot the same shot every time. Impossible, A, for that to happen in the game. And B, that's not solving the problem, making that player a better shooter. So that 
that is kind of how I would approach it. I hope that makes sense, but it was a great question. I, I, and it's something I thought a lot about recently in terms of if I was working with NBA players, how would I go about it? No, it does make sense. I guess the, the question back, which you'll probably get from some of the NBA players or coaches is traditionally you would have had individuals that have done high repetition, high volume work from corners or particular zones on the floor. And maybe they have had success or they felt like they've had success, which has allowed them to feel more confident in the shot and, and whatnot. So I, I guess the question on the back of that is why, why have those individuals got that mindset and why do they feel like that high volume, high repetition work does work? Of course it's a few things. I think it's, it's survivorship bias, right? And it's, it's, it's in spite of, not because of, right? Um, so, and this, and this is the thing. It's like a lot of the coaches, uh, coaching, especially in the NBA level, according to how they were coached as players. So then the whole cycle just continues. And it's like, it's a shame because we look at all the players in the history of the NBA who could have been sufficient shooters, but never had the chance to do that. Right. And survivorship bias, it's basically like, you know, we see the store, the success stories, but we never see all the players who trained using that same way and never made it. And, um, and for me, it's like, I would show the evidence. And I think a lot of players are really smart and intelligent. And it's like, if I just explain to them something even really simple, I'm not going into ecological dynamics because that's very complex, but just talking about blocked versus like blocked constant versus blocked variable practice and all the benefits and research um, in terms of training other ways instead of using blocked and constant. So stuff like that, I would explain and say, you know, this is why we're doing this. Um, and, I, and I think it's the relationship is key. And this is why with a lot of my coaching, um, I'm so attuned to the need to meet the player where they're at and develop a rapport with them have a sense of humor and and to actually have it have my sessions enjoyable for the player and most of the times i don't think shooting 100 shots on the same spot in a row is enjoyable right and i think players are intelligent they can i think they a lot of them would understand that having some game like reps um where they're not making every shot is going to help them more than a situation where they're making 100 shots in a row now, having said that, if a player, if I was working with an NBA player and they said to me, I just want to do, you know, maybe pre-game or whatever, I just want to bang out 100 shots in a row, I am there to support them as their coach, right? So it's like in a situation like that, I would not be like, no, we're going to do it this way. If, if that's what they want, I'm going to do it. But the idea is hopefully maybe they've been exposed in other sessions with me to training some different ways and eventually they see the benefit to doing that more than the traditional approach. But um, in that context, I wouldn't come in, Michael, and be like, you're doing this way. You know, that doesn't align with how I view coaching and and everything of that nature. Good. So I guess off the back of that, um, my question would be, if you're looking at someone who, and I'll put this in inverted commas, is broken in terms of yep. how they shoot or how they drive or how they dribble, what steps are you put in that in? Because I know um, looking at your bio previously, you obviously worked kind of across the globe. You set up initiatives in Africa as part of the NBA and all that type of stuff. And then I appreciate in some of those environments, they probably wouldn't always have the most knowledgeable of coaches in their formative years where they would be able to support them in what you'd identify as the, the, the best way. So how, as they get older, do you go around correcting something that is going to be a, of a real issue or a real bad right. habit that actually is going to hold them back so two, two good things we can unpack here i think one of the things is a lot of coaches believe that players have to be taught fundamentals first to avoid these supposed bad habits right and and that's if anything i think that's really preventing players from being as skilled as they can be because they're being confined to doing 
particular movements which might not suit them and it's basically it's over constraining them and it's taking away their ability to do other things so for me it's from the earliest age possible i want players to have various functional movement solutions not fundamentals so let's take um i did passing the other day let's take finishing it's really easy I don't want players to do a fundamental finish of a right, left footwork, use the correct hand, i.e. right hand on the right side, left hand on the left side. It's And the problem with is every player is taught the layup and they've, they're shown this technique as the right way, the supposed correct way of scoring. And then think how many players, hundreds of thousands of players around the world, are being held back from finishing in more creative ways. And the irony is that players then, have, often by their skills trainer, will be retaught an advanced finishing solution, such as like a one-step finish. They're retaught it at a, at a later age, whereas they could be doing that from like 11 years old if, if the coach allowed it with the environment that they're creating in practice. So let's go back to finishing. I would rather have players who can finish using as many varied solutions as possible and being attuned to affordances so they can really read the positioning of like the defense, know whether it's like a good decision to finish or do something else like pass pass or keep going, like use a Nash dribble. For me, that's much more important than having these specific techniques. Um, I think going back to the bad habits thing, the small-sided games will basically... If, a, if there's a, a, a habit which isn't effective, players will discover that in the small-sided game, right? So, for instance, if a player um, cannot dribble well on their left hand driving, uh, driving at speed, then the, self, the small-sided game will reveal that. And then I will create like a one-on-one -on -one where maybe the, they have a small advantage, but the defender is on their right hip, so they have to use their left hand, right? And they're going to get repetition out repetition, learning how to drive while keeping that ball away from their defender and then finishing at the rim, right? So the right, that's an example of smart manipulation of task constraints to develop that skill. So for me, it's, it's as a coach, I have to be, I really have to know my kids and my players and know, you know, what it is, what things will help them the most and then I recreate those conditions in the practice and that's how they improve. Um, and a key part of this too, Michael, is just remembering that skill is skill emerges within that specific sequence, within that environment, within a particular possession in a game, a small sided game. You know, that's when we see skill emerging. It's not necessarily something that a player owns. Like coaches will often talk about a player like, possessing skill or owning a particular technique skill is emergent we see it emerge within the game and so how do you diffuse over reliance on a particular skill that m might have challenges moving forward so le let's say you've got a 6-2 point guard who when he's going into finishing the lane is a little bit lazy with the way that he lays up. And you think, well, at the moment, he's playing against centres that are 6'3", and actually they're not going to be in a position to challenge that. But, you know, if you do make that jump where all of a sudden you've got, you know, Valachunis or Rudy Gobert or Rackinale, yeah. Shaq and stuff who have got very long wingspans and are able to jump that little bit higher, physically that more capable, that's going to put him in trouble there how do you go around diffusing that over reliance on a particular skill okay great question first thing michael i want to do we have to do the opposite if you do have big players we have to do the opposite to what we see in the nba and nca and then player development have the big and the guard together so they can actually work on these situations right what do we do well we put the guards together and the bigs together and then they're not actually working on the exact same situations the same affordances that they would be acting upon within the game so that's one thing if you do have the players and you're doing a one-on-one -on -one, have like a guard actually play against the big and on obviously to change the matchups frequently so you respect the role of individual constraints 
So maybe instead of playing against the same person every time, the offense has one player who's really big, one player who's smaller, but maybe has a bigger wingspan, one player who's smaller, but has a bigger vertical. And then they have to come up with new solutions based on those constraints. All right, now most coaches won't have that, okay? So they maybe, like you said, they've got a really good prospect who is a point guard and they got a 6'3 center, okay? So how can you develop their finishing? For me, it's difficult, right? Because you can't truly prepare them for that next level if you don't have that big player, right? And that, and that is why, especially in the higher level clubs in Europe, it's critical that a lot of these academies have the first kind of recruits they get is a big because only is it important because obviously it develops the guard better for that specific reason. You just can't recreate height, right? Um, so then it, it, it can't, it, it's, it's Maya, right? What, what else can we do? What's the most advanced thing we could do without having that player? And for me, this would be task constraints, which get them finishing in loads of different ways, right? Something you could do maybe, and I don't do this all the time because it's not task representative, but maybe use a prop in some, in a live one-on-one -on -one where maybe they hold like some type of thing, which makes them bigger and it's still live. Right. And, but they're trying to block that and the offense has to finish around them. Right. That could be one solution. The problem is we can't do that all the time because in that situation, the defender is not going to have the affordance to reach in and steal right? Or move as subtly as a defender will do when they're not holding an object. So we can't do that too much, right? So we have to get the balance right. So then I'd pair that with a lot of one-on-ones and maybe one against twos where there are different advantages, defense coming from different angles, the offense coming from different angles, sometimes off a dribble, off a cut. And the idea is I can still have a good level of challenge within these activities. I did a lot of one-on-one and one-on-two this year, a lot. Yeah, that, that makes complete sense. And I guess kind of moving away from this topic slightly, if you like, which is what made you go down this road? As I alluded to earlier, you've had a lot of um, exposure to different environments across Europe and into Africa, et cetera. Was there any particular moment that stood out to you to say, actually, this, there's got to be a better way than what we're doing with the, with the players right now? Yeah. All right, so it never, it, I'd say I was more of a games approach coach like like three, four years ago. So I, I didn't do much of the traditional like one on zero, two on zero. I never did that actually, but it would be more, I'd say I was more games approach where I was creating problems for players and letting them play. I wasn't like manipulating constraints smartly and I, I had no kind of theoretical understanding of this stuff. Um, so I, I always, I wasn't ever really traditional in the traditional sense of things because it, you know what, it just didn't sit well with me. I, I didn't know, I wasn't aware then of the research and the evidence base. Um, but I just, I didn't, the traditional stuff, it never sat well with me. I don't know why, but it just, it just didn't. Um, so then actually how I discovered kind of CLA was through Marco Sullivan and, uh, the talent equation with Stuart Armstrong. And then I got onto Rob Gray's podcast and then that opened up a whole new, uh, new can of worms. So then I got more into the research, the studies, met a lot of really, it's been great. I've actually had so many conversations with coaches in other sport applying these things. And that's where I've learned far more from that than actually within my own sport of basketball. And partly too, because there's no one, I don't think who's really trailblazed and gone full in on ecological i'd say two influences of mine have definitely been mike mckay and uh the guy called pete lonergan in australia but i do think i'm kind of the first coach to show what going fully in on cla looks like in context so because i couldn't necessarily get everything there wasn't like a basketball example of how of what ecological looks like so it was more i had to come to my own conclusions from other sports speaking with other coaches who are really interested in this stuff, like the NBA coach I mentioned earlier, and two of my friends who are doing the same stuff, they just don't have time to share on social media, but they're doing ecological dynamics too. And it's like, it's a process of trying it, figuring it out and seeing what works, what doesn't work. And it was, I think too, just the more I read the, the research papers and all of that, listen to podcasts, the more and more, 
the ideas aligned with me and made more sense. Perfect. So looking looking at the exposure that you've had kind of across the globe and stuff, is there any a particular experience or your time working with the MBA? And, you know, as I said, I think one of the buyers I said, it was 35 countries that you've kind of worked across. Is there any one particular uh, experience that sticks with you as to, you know, how individuals can grow an environment or what a good growth culture environment looks like and, and kind of that, that yeah. that's helped you formulate your idea now in Italy. Okay, man, I had an amazing time at the NBA because I had a really cool team to work with. And I, I was living the life of Riley. You know, I, was, I started when I was 21 and, you know, I had a corporate car where I could spend an obscene amount of money, obviously on travel expenses, but still, and then stay in ridiculous hotels, go for ridiculous meals. Like, yeah, for me, at such a young age, it was crazy. And it was, but for me, it actually made me more determined to do what I'm doing now because I saw the entrenched traditions, not just in terms of basketball coaching, but also from a corporate standpoint, culture standpoint. And it was like everything I was learning, reading, researching, it was like, for me, I, I, it wasn't applied within the MBA world, right? It was very traditional and that's what inspired me. And, you know, I could have been super comfortable and had a job for life and, you know, I was popular there because I worked really hard and I did things differently, but it was creative. I, you know, used the, my innovative ideas, but within the MBA guidelines, but I felt like I could never truly do what I wanted to do and, sh and show my ideas because of those limitations I had being in a big traditional company. So actually it was like, no, I was like, could I end up working for an MBA team by staying in the league office and then making connections and move to an MBA team? Yes, probably. But am I going to change the basketball world and be a trailblazer and be respected for my coaching, my innovation, my creativity? Probably not, because I'll, I'll be getting that job just through connections and who I know. And I never want to be that guy who is who gets a job just because of that. Of course, it's I want people to I want to get on with people. I want people to like think I'm, I've got a good sense of humor. I can bring a lot. But I want them to primarily hire me because of my skill set and what I'm doing, not just because of a connection. I, I just felt like, you know, the NBA, it's a big, it's like an exclusive men's club in some regard. Okay. And I'm not, I don't want to talk badly on, on anything because there are amazing, amazing staff in the NBA world. But it's like, for me, my values are more coaching with e an ecological framework in a way that aligns with the research and transformational coaching. And I'm not going to sell myself out and not do those things just to get an MBA job, if that makes sense. So it's like, I think a lot of coaches want to chase the status and things like that. And for me, I'm more, I'm more concerned with kind of coaching in a way which aligns with who I am as a person. And if an MBA opportunity happens to arise with a team because of that, of course, I would be absolutely delighted but it's like, whether I get into the NBA, into an NBA team or not, that doesn't define me as a person and my success career-wise in terms of trying to change the basketball world and show coaches another way. So I guess my, my next question is, how do you or the players you're working with um, make that jump across? Because, you know, we can watch Last Chance You in terms of how how some of the, the American collegiate sports can be, can, can be. I'm sure that not everyone's like that, but there will be situations where people maybe go and want to stick down traditional routes. So how do you go about preparing either yourself, if you were to make that jump, or probably more importantly at the moment, your players from leaving your environment, which is as it is a lot of ownership, a lot of this to maybe going into an NCAA environment or maybe going into a, mba environment hmm. that could be very very different and that actually totally. doesn't mirror what you're doing at, at all yeah absolutely michael so um on one side i like to think that through our approach the players are going to be very skilled so that when they do leave here just in terms of their ability to play basketball at a high level they're going to have that and naturally if you could do that i think you can fit in anywhere, right? But like you said, the coaching, no doubt, will be different. 
So for me, it's like, I'm, I'm not willing to change my coaching approach. And for instance, say, all right, we're going to do a three man weave now because this NCA coach does it. And you're going to be doing that at the next level. Right. Cause that, that doesn't align with my values, but I like to think that all the, the, um, personality traits that the players develop through our style and through things like our mindfulness and our life skills sessions off the court. I like to think it's that which will prepare them for the next level. So things like, you know, the fact that we compete every single practice in small sided games, well, they're developing resiliency there. They're learning how to respond when they're not playing well, how to take feedback. Right. And it's these things which will transfer, even if they're in a traditional environment, those are the, characteristics which will help them get through that and two it's like something i do in our player development is show players how they can develop by by themselves if they don't have a coach doing like the cla i I actually show them and i say to them if you had a student manager which you have in the ncaa this is how you play guided defense so you can teach them how to actually play guided defense on you so you get repetition at repetition And I'm actually, so a big part of it is actually educating them on how they can work out if they're by themselves and all they have like 10 minutes before practice. So it's better than nothing like a one on zero. Um, I think for coaches, it's, it's just a case of, and maybe we're 10 years away from it happening. Right. Because obviously I think teams are far away from really incorporating skill acquisition and this into the coaching maybe not i don't know i could be wrong i think it takes like one coach like the coach i mentioned earlier who really is a pioneer and believes in this stuff and they they have the the environment where they can do this i.e maybe like a young team compared to a team of veterans right and they they can do this and then and then that's how things start changing because they other coaches as they move to other teams they'll be like oh well when we were here we did it this way and it worked really well and you know so it's like that's what will get the wheels in motion to to get all this change and i think the other thing too mike was that's also the reason why i'm sharing so much on social media in the hope that this picks up and that other coaches can hopefully use some of my ideas apply their own thinking to it make the game even better and then we all win at the end of the day Tell you what it will take. It will take someone to win. As soon as someone wins doing it, it's a copycat world. So as soon as someone wins doing that, you'll have every man and his dog doing it. Um, Exactly. I I guess the the comeback is, and this is something I've got an internal battle with at the moment, is do you think you're under-preparing your players if you don't give them exposure to that type of coaching? Um. Okay, so this is funny because when I was in Germany earlier this year, that was the exact rationale a big club used to justify why their like U18 coach was so traditional and like shouting at the players, all of this. The rationale was because our senior team's coach is like this, so we need to prepare them for that. Exactly what you're saying. Um, for me, like I can completely understand why clubs think that way. But again, it just, if we have that attitude, basketball will stay the same as it always has been. And we're never going to advance the sport forward. So I completely get it. Um, but also, I think it's good sometimes, if, like, for instance, with my program, I think players know what other coaching looks like because they've had it in the past. And sometimes, you know, they might go for a camp somewhere else and they, and they see it, right? And it's like, I think they they appreciate how different it is because they've had that experience before of traditional coaching. They know it's out there, right? Um, but I think the the solution is I don't think we can use it as a justification to use those things because then we just we can never move the game forward, you know. And I think you know sometimes you might want to bring in a guest coach or something who is traditional, and the players like, oh shit, this is really what is happening most of the time and they appreciate the stuff they do with you even more but for me it's like i my job as the coach is to prepare them as best as i can in a way that aligns with the evidence so if i start doing all that traditional stuff yelling and screaming at them well all the evidence exists shows us that that is not preparing them as effectively as it can be and therefore i deem it as me not preparing them as best as i can to help them fulfill their potential as their coach 
Okay, so if I were to ask, say to you, what's the most important quality or skill or uh, thing that a player you're preparing to make that jump across from Europe into the States for NCAA or NBA or European leagues, professional leagues here, what's the one most important factor you need to prepare them with? What is that? I use the word adaptive because it applies to any situation. Can they adapt in each like phase of the game in many different skills? Can they adapt based on what's happening in front of them? And can they have a solution which is effective for what's facing them? And that, that to me is the essence of player development, developing adaptive players, not just in half-court offense, but in all four phases of the game. So I'd say adaptiveness. And, you know, I think particularly if you were to look at one skill per se, it would be adaptiveness, particularly within shooting, which is uh, absolutely critical these days. That's it. And then last question for me, which is um, obviously you work with a lot of high-level high people. Who is either the best player or the best practitioner that you've worked with or against and why? Great question. Um, okay, practitioner, in terms of who I speak with outside of basketball, I'd say Mark O'Sullivan. Um, inside the basketball world, in terms of coaches I've actually worked with, I'd say um, Chris Oliver, Mike McKay, Pete Lonergan. Um, that's a really good question. In, in terms of players, um, I have had the chance to work out some NBA players in the past, which has been cool. But it's like, for me, I would only consider a player someone who I actually work with during the course of a whole year. Because it's like, I can't take credit. Even if I do like eight sessions with someone, player development, I can't take credit for any of that success. Even in a year, if we accept non-linear non, you know, non com pedagogy complex systems, all right, a lot of the improvement in a player could be down to the player development, but it could be down to the work with the strength and conditioning coach or what the head coach does in terms of empowering them, giving them confidence, or maybe a sleep scientist we have on the team who gets them sleeping better, right? So we, the thing is we, we can't know. But I would say this, it's like um, I've, I've got a, two players in particular right now of my program who um, I think have really excellent long-term potential. So, and it's, we just finished our first season. So it's like, I, we're not going to know, unfortunately for a few years, but I'm really, really just excited to see kind of where, where they go. And I'm just hoping that where they go after this is the right environment so they can keep their development. And obviously I'm really going to do a lot of work to help them choose the best situation. Perfect. Listen, Alex, really appreciate your time. I think a really interesting discussion around how um, culturally that trying to make a shift within basketball to constraint their stuff. I know that's been a big push, particularly in football. Um, and it'd be interesting to check in with you again at some um, point to see how that, that transformation is coming across and um, how your players are finding it. So really appreciate your time and catch up with you again soon. No, absolutely. Thanks so much, Michael. And, you know, any coaches listening to this, please do reach out to me. Uh, my Twitter is Alex J. Sarama and my Instagram is Alex Sarama. So I share a lot, but love to hear from you. So just send me a DM and, uh, and be in touch. Perfect. Appreciate your time and catch you soon. Thanks for listening to the Sports Initiative podcast with me, Michael Wright. Please remember to follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram at the Sports Initiative podcast and share this podcast with friends and family. I'll see you next week.